Hello, BookTube. We're going to do bookshelf number four of the corner bookcase today. And once again, the light is iffy on me, but clean on the books. So you're just going to have to concentrate on them instead of me. <laughs> and we'll start with the uh, the transverse books first. Uh, starting with this, this is David Carroll, Swamp Walker's Journal. Uh, it's full of <coughs> illustrations. It's He's a... Look at that. Isn't that lovely? It's he's a naturalist of the first order, just a, a, also something of an ingrown toenail. So his observations come from hours and hours of time spent outdoors, which is wonderful. Uh, and then we have, along the same lines, but a century earlier, Sally Carrigar. This is Icebound Summer, uh, with a lovely trade paperback. I had these in mass markets forever. These have. Uh, even more beautiful illustrations <laughs> uh, by someone whose name we've uh, encountered here on this bookshelf tour before, Henry Bugby Kane, who did, who did done, he's done fantastic illustrations, black and white illustrations, and they're all throughout this room. <laughs> Although this, uh, Sally Carragher is also a fantastic writer. Uh, and then, uh, something we've seen on this channel before, The Tale of Genji. This is the, uh, the beautiful Tuttle paperback of the Arthur Whaley translation, the, the first English language translation to gain an enormous amount of currency. Uh, Whaley takes enormous liberties with the text and can't be relied on, uh, despite the fact that he put a whole lifetime of work into it. And yet, his translation is wonderful to read, so worth keeping. And then, uh, keep continuing on with transverse books here, we have uh, a self-published novel called To Prove a Villain uh, by K.C. Warwick. And this is about Christopher Marlowe. That is supposed to be, that super hottie on the cover is supposed to be Christopher Marlowe. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a, it's a, just what it says, a self-published novel about Christopher Marlowe. I have a weakness for fiction about Christopher Marlowe because his life lends itself to the novelist's touch. We know <clears throat> enticingly little about what, what seemed like on the surface the most important and interesting parts of his life. So, it's an open invitation to, to novelists. And the next one is that as well. The next one is uh, is called, it's by uh, D.K. Marley, and it's uh, Blood and Ink. Also a self-published novel, also about Christopher Marlowe. Uh, and then we move on. I do believe on the shelf we have yet another Christopher Marlowe novel. <laughs> but first, uh, we hear from my profession. This is the, the old Everyman's Library uh, mass market sized hardcover of the essays of Matthew Arnold. <clears throat> a great uh, book essayist. Just fantastic. Uh, then we have The Mystery of the Princes by Audrey Williamson. This is about uh, the princes in the tower and what, what happened to them and when and what the best speculation is. And so is this next one, a great book, also called The Princes in the Tower, <clears throat> called by Elizabeth Jenkins. This is, uh, and I think this is an old Pimlico paperback? The Phoenix Press. Uh, but her book... Of the, of the 80 million books on The Princes in the Tower, hers is the one to get if you only get one. So, it'll, The Princes in the Tower, Elizabeth Jenkins. Also a source of fascination for me, also for the same reason as Christopher Marlowe, because we'll never actually know the backstairs stuff that went on. It's an open invitation to fiction. Uh, then we have Sir Ronald Sim. This is History in Ovid, a slim book of his in which he looks at the poetry of Ovid and sifts through it for verifiable, checkable history. Which is, a, you know, sounds like a lunatic project on its face, but he is the, was the greatest Roman historian of a century, so uh, the book is absolutely thrilling. <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, J.A. Sutherland, Victorians, Novelists, and Publishers. This is, a, this is not really a book about you know, Middlemarch and Elizabeth Gaskell, but rather about what they and their male surrogates had to go through to get their books published and, and what everybody else had to do as well. Uh, I love that sort of thing. Uh, histories of the publishing industry, especially in the relatively modern era where you, you get to learn uh, the differences and similarities with today. I just love that. Uh, and then, oh, here we go. <laughs> this is Tamerlane Must Die by Louise Welsh, a tiny, surrealistic uh Marlowe novella uh, that is really good. <laughs> Just really, really good. Uh, we've got another tiny thing here. Oh, okay, this is Francis Thompson's biography of Shelley. Uh, just a little thing, really, not, not uh, <clears throat> even though the type is big, it's really just an essay. Uh, I must have found it at the Brattle. Uh, let's see. Yes, I found it at the Brattle. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and then we have this. This is so much fun. This is called William and His Friends. And it is, let me see if I can show you the picture. It is about uh, one particular hippo <laughs> at an art museum here in Boston. He, uh, it's, and the, the, this is a tiny little museum book is all about the animals at that museum. <laughs> I, I thought it was incredibly charming. Uh, and then we have this, Frank O'Connor's short stories. Uh, there's, uh, I think this is almost all of them. He spent a vigorous lifetime writing short stories, and they're all jagged and rock hard and brilliant, and some are very funny. <laughs> uh, he's not mentioned on on BookTube, of course, because he's he's old and gone and Irish, uh, but he's fantastic as a short story writer. He's fantastic. Uh, and then we have. Yet another edition of Moby Dick. <laughs> this is the Barnes & Noble edition. And the reason that I got it, even though it has no critical apparatus whatsoever, is because of the cover. That is a frame from the Classics Illustrated Moby Dick, drawn by Bill Sankiewicz, who those of you who know comic books will know. He's a toweringly great figure. It's, it's like having uh, Michelangelo do uh, Classics Illustrated for, for Benvenuto Cellini. Uh, it's, it's an amazing thing that he did. His, his Classics Illustrated Moby Dick is probably, I don't know, I haven't checked, but it's probably intensely collectible online. <clears throat> and that is an amazing panel from it, a blurred white tail descending against the complete black of the, of the ocean. Uh, and that was enough for me. <laughs> and then we have... Uh, uh, copy, not the only one in this room, of The House on Nosset March by Wyman Richardson. Uh, an absolutely enchanting book about uh, a big, rambling, turn-of-the-20th century house on Cape Cod. Uh, and this is illustrated, as you will be able to guess by now, by Henry Bugby King. <laughs> uh, and is amazing. It may very well be, in a crowded field, it may very well be the best Cape Cod book ever written. Um, I can't recommend it high enough. If you're if, you, if you've been there and somehow haven't read it, you should. And if you haven't been there and maybe never will be there, it will give you an amazing sense of a Cape Cod that is now gone, uh, th but that was wonderful. Uh -huh. and, then, and then we have something that ha you will certainly recognize. This is the God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. Uh, his this is the hardcover edition, which I got over the paperback because the hardcover edition Dawkins. Uh, this is his screed against organized religion, and uh, the thing I like about the hardcover is that it's, in ideal conditions, supposed to be a mirror, and is supposed to thereby underscore his contention that, that the whole thing about organized religion is you. That you When you look at it, you're looking at a mirror. <laughs> uh, I kind of like that. Uh, then we have an oldie but a goodie. This is, uh, this is Twelve Against the Gods by William Bolitho, uh, which is his... Uh, potted biographies. There's a collection of 12 biographies of uh, who's in here? Uh, figures from history that, that uh, appealed to him. Alexander the Great, Christopher Columbus, Muhammad, uh, Napoleon, uh, two of them, <laughs> Napoleon and Napoleon III, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and he is such a spirited writer that you, you're just along for the ride when he does this. <laughs> there, w w there's no other writer, there's certainly no writer today who could do what he does, which is to periodically say, may we pause for a moment to be indignant? <laughs> so I highly recommend this if you see it, you know, being given away for free at a junk shop or something like that, because no one remembers this book anymore. It sold really well, but no one remembers it. Uh, what have we got next? Oh, good. Excellent. This is The Owl Who Liked Sitting on Caesar. Uh, this is, uh, as you can tell from the cover, this is a story of uh, a, a man who adopts an owl. And his life with the owl. And it's, you know, a, a hackneyed premise. I have, I've read a hundred books like this, but this one's really, really good. It's a, it stands as a, an excellent uh, modern successor to a book we will certainly encounter in this room called Owl. Uh, about the exact same thing. Someone who adopts an owl. Uh, so, And then we have the last... Uh, oh, no, it's not the last book. It's close to it, though. This is also a, a bit of an heirloom. This is Greg Swimbolian's uh, Men on Men. This is the first of his anthologies for plume of uh, of gay short stories, and it's a uh, the with these faded uh, <laughs> 1990s style covers. Uh, this 
the Men on Men series went on. I think it did double digits. But the, the first three, Greg Stambolian's first three, were as much a curated collection of his pushing back against the night of AIDS as it was a literary collection. Now, it's just just a, a lucky chance that he was, he's a great judge of, of fiction. So the, the gay short stories that you get in these first three volumes, and especially in this first one, really do mark an era. They really do. They mark an era when gay, letter, gay letters, gay literature, was increasingly under the impression that it had to raise its voice against the end of everything. And that the end was coming, but that it was literature's place to speak about it. And so the, the stories are a weird combination of things that look back on an, on an idyllic past, a past that suddenly looks idyllic, even though it wasn't idyllic to live through, and, and things that concentrate on the unthinkable, on, on the end of everything. It's not like those, those men on men, those early volumes, are not like most other literary anthologies. They have a, um, a weight to them. Uh, time and circumstance has given them that makes them must reading I think uh, and then we have the last thing here this is the book of dogs <laughs> this is an old uh, I think it's from the 1930s uh, no 1919 it's, it's a 1919 National Geographic book of dogs I snap these things up when I see them where you have the, the original artwork because it cost a mint to put photos in, in books uh, and uh, descriptions of well, what they're like. There, there they are on World War One battlefield. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's it. That is the one, two, three, fourth bookshelf of the corner bookcase. <laughs> that wasn't too painful, was it? Uh, uh, and I'm gonna, I will, I will remember to annotate a lot of these down below because I'm sure I've bloviated about them in the past. And I'll see you soon, book two. Thank you. <laughs>